The manga begins with Pope Boria's revelation of finally finding a match for his daughter Enzo de Boria, the second son of the house shouts in shock. He opines that it has only been six months since her last engagement was called off and the father must give his sister a little time to adjust. Irrespective of the gains, they must consider his sister's feelings too. In response, Pope reminds them of their inability to fight the barbarians without support from Britannia. Enzo also accepts that barbarians are the best fighters in the South and he can't fight them alone. Pope Boria tells his daughter about her proposed fiancé. He is Britannia's hero and the king's nephew and is the best knight in the North. Enzo shouts hearing about the infamous knight. His reputation is very dirty compared to other knights in the North. Despite a lot to ponder, Ruby first pukes as much as she can and the murder list of the best knight because she falls on the list too. Due to the helicopter, Ruby eventually got rid of her tiresome past life, but just when she was thinking that she can finally rest, Ruby finds herself reincarnated as a fictional novel character from Renaissance-era drama, the novel she read before the accident. Though the miseries of her life have not changed a bit, moreover, she has anorexia in this life too. Before she became Rebecca de Boria, she was a Korean-born kid who was raised in Spain and was commonly referred to as the charity child. Although she enjoyed the privileges because of her noble family, from enrolling in a prestigious school to living a life full of horse riding and parties. However, one day few boys made a mocking gesture towards Ruby, and the unaware Ruby laughed back at them in response. The bullying kept going on with her age and Ruby developed patience to some extent. The family who adopted her had a welcoming facade with each one of her parents having a separate lover and her brother being a drug addict. The brother she used to look up to turn into a monster just like his father, the act of a perfect daughter, bright, cheerful, and obedient, become a daily routine for Ruby, because Ruby had a price to pay for her every wrongdoing, and it turned out to be no different in this life as well. By the age of 16, Ruby came across a novel from a fiction side called Sodom and the Holy Grail, and she became the villains of the novel Rebecca B. Boria. The novel was about a corrupt pope back in the times when the pope's powers were very high. Therefore, the members of the clergy and the dukes of the north combined to overthrow Pope Boria and his family. Being the daughter of the corrupted pope, Redbeckia, the daughter of the pope, is bound to die soon, that too at the hands of her husband. Redbeckia had four marriages for political purposes, and Isaac van Omerta, hailing from the Britanniary kingdom, had been serving as a knight since the age of 15. He went on to participate in the infamous war against Marmel at the age of 17. He became the youngest to win the war. And ever since his success, Isaac had this ability to make the heart of any woman waver, though Isaac insisted on staying unmarried and his weird desire always troubled his father, and the only lady he ever looked comfortable with was her sister Freya. The reason for his resentment for the marriage was the death of his mother who fell in love with a young duke and took her own life. That particular day changed their entire lives. Unfortunately, the last princess took her own life in a society that bore a stigma, entailing that those who take their own lives were the cursed god and are damned to turn into ghouls. Even the king used to abstain from discussing such taboo topics, however, he responded gracefully to Rebecca's marriage proposal. At present, the church has already stationed its soldiers at the battle camps, leaving them with scarce resources to resist the fierce barbarian knights, threatening to take over them at the first instance. Therefore, Rebecca's marriage to Isaac is the price for acquiring the support of outstanding Britannian knights. In the novel, the very reason which impelled Isaac to go against his father-in-law was the incident when Rebecca poisoned his sister, though she was compelled by Caesar. In the novel, there were speculations that Rebecca was Pope's spy, but there were reasons behind her adverse personality. Be it Isaac's sister or her best friend, everyone treated Rebecca like a maid. Upon entering the novel after three years, she can now understand the miseries which lead Rebecca to develop such a fragile personality. For the people, she is the princess of Romagna, the Lark of Sistina. Her brother Caesar enters the room and breaks her spell of thoughts. Caesar has been worried about his sister. Since the discussions at the dining table, Ruby's expressions suggest that she is not well. Caesar asks Ruby to honestly tell him if she does not like the marriage proposal. On the other hand, Ruby finds it very funny that Caesar is unaware of the fact that soon he will be hit by the knight. However, she pretends to be fine with the proposal and is only a matter of distance which has been troubling her, and she will not be able to see her family often because North is too far from here. Ruby expresses her desire to stay with Caesar who appears overwhelmed by the fact the prettiest lady of the Romagna Empire wants to be with him after all. Although Caesar is obsessed with her, she is well aware that it's only a matter of moment before he turns violent and takes advantage of her. Ruby was adopted by this house when she was 15 and was forced to marry the Duke of Rembrandt, a character who was involved in humiliating her family later. Because of her family, Ruby refused to marry him to prevent the forthcoming downfall. 
and her refusal turned things upside down for her, she can't forget the Pope's cold stare. That night she was beaten till she begged Caesar for the mercy of her life, it was then she realized that not being the biological daughter also had its impact on the atrocities laid upon her. Carmen, the lady who gave birth to Rebecca, died during her labor, she was pregnant before meeting the Pope. The situation was indifferent to her real life, so Rebecca quickly learned to act. To Rebecca, Caesar is nothing more than a psychopath who seeks pain for pleasure. Rebecca fears that there is an abundance of monsters in the north. Caesar assures her that she will be protected by the knights in the north. Moreover, he will visit her now and then. Caesar maintains that it's only a matter of half a year and Rebecca should consider it merely a trip for the time being. In her stay in the north, Rebecca will not be touched by Isaac, therefore she must not fret. Rebecca acts as if she will be depressed by his absence, but deep down her heart, she is overwhelmed that this psychopath will not be around her. Rebecca wonders about the outcomes if she does not poison Isaac's sister, but she is certain that Caesar will do it even if she does not. As things stand in a period of half a year, Rebecca has to save his husband's sister and prove her innocence to her husband. On the wedding day, Rebecca steps out of the room dressed exquisitely. The Pope shivers in disbelief seeing his beautiful daughter. Rebecca acts like she is gutted to leave the place and her dear father, but the truth is the opposite. The Pope excuses to send her brother on the journey to the north with Rebecca, but little does she care. In this entire situation, Enzo is the only person who feels uncomfortable by the wary stares of the northern knights. On top of that, Enzo has been the only opponent of this decision. He is the person who least troubled Rebecca during her entire stay. The last person to greet Rebecca before his departure is Caesar. Rebecca reiterates her question and Caesar assures her to visit her in the north. Rebecca's newly developed are both commendable. In the past, she wanted to die and eventually died, but now she aspires to live and protect herself. In the northern jungles, the knight conveys his reservations to Isaac regarding the increasing deaths of their men, but Isaac does not approve the thought of heading back. Since Ellen has asked him not to do so, grinding his teeth in anger, the man probes why Isaac is acting so rigid when he already knows the gravity of the matter and he does not want to be bothered by Isaac's actions. Meanwhile, the man informs him regarding the arrival of his bride, though he is well aware of the fact that Isaac is least interested in this matter. But he hopes that Isaac will at least have a meal with her. Isaac smirks back at him and takes a dig that people have gone to see her instead of him. The knight bursts out that he went to see his bride because he was curious about her, he was wondering what the famous daughter of the Pope would look like. The knight maintains that if Isaac is so bothered by his visit, then he must go and see her by himself. Continuing with her argument, the knight ponders whether Isaac will ask questions about his future bride, about her looks and personality, etc., but Isaac blatantly denies the possibility. The knight insists that Isaac must go and see her, after all, it's his duty as her husband, moreover, he must not let others mock him like the Rembrandt. The knight expresses the common beliefs circling the house that Isaac's marriage will not last long with the Pope's daughter, and he must have gone with Freya directly. Earlier, Rebecca was escorted to the Omerta Castle, according to Sir Evans, who attended the wedding on behalf of Isaac. Rebecca suffered seasickness throughout the journey. Nevertheless, his bride lives up to the rumors of her beauty with a pretty smile dawned on her face. But she is short heightened. The knight points with his hand as if he is describing a dwarf. He advises Isaac to understand her position and how frightened and lonely Rebecca must feel when she will be treated like a hostage here. Isaac cannot digest the sudden transition in his thoughts for the girl. As far as Isaac remembers, he was ready to kill the Pope not so long ago. Their argument ends with a voice coming from behind and they impulsively turn towards the man the knight is disgusted when his junior points the sword at him. The young man is Lorenzo who proposes Isaac marry his sister instead. Until then, he requests Sir Isaac to pretend like he does not know her. Trembling in fear, Lorenzo has misapprehended the scenario. Instead, he wanted to request Isaac to stay away from his sister. Otherwise, Lorenzo fears that the Borgia women may kill his sister, and the knight snubs Lorenzo to watch his mouth and speak some sense. But Lorenzo is adamant that his words are unprejudiced. The knight maintains that when Rebecca arrived, Freya and Princess Elena were busy holding a tea party. How come she cried? On the contrary, Isaac ignores them both and heads back home. Meanwhile, other knights pretend that they did not hear a thing in their conversation. Princess Elenia asks about Rudbeckia's well-being since she heard about her seasickness. Rudbeckia clarifies that it's only her first time traveling for so long she has never set foot outside the south. Elenia believes that there's nothing to be embarrassed of as she has also never set foot outside north. Accompanying Elena at the dining table, Rudbeckia is all eyes for her mesmerizing beauty. Elenia anxiously probes if Rebecca liked the food, though she had already instructed the chef to prepare the dishes according to Ruby's liking. Elenia further briefs Ruby regarding the spider-like monster, 
Iraq who is rampant in summer, moreover, she conveys Isaac's message regarding his late arrival. Adding to that, Elenia tells Ruby that her father is also on a mission and he will be returning later this month. Elenia has been managing the palace since her mother's demise, but she understands that now she must change it according to the liking of Isaac's wife and Ruby must freely express her suggestion if she considers a change essential. Ruby thanks Elenia for the consideration, but she expresses her desire to stay low for the time being and get used to the customs of the palace. Elenia assures that Ruby must not be anxious regarding her actions since no one would dare to question her decisions. Ruby hesitatingly asks Elenia for a favor. She desires to be called by her name than her title. She is surrounded by the strangers in this palace and Ruby fears if she will ever get used to the environment here and Elenia of friendly behavior can help her learn better. Elenia agrees to her suggestion and overwhelmed by the favor. Ruby holds her hand and thanks Elenia. On top of that, Ruby inquires if she can also call the princess by her name and Ellen allows her. Ellen believes that it's not a good idea for Ruby to retreat from her, as excessive modesty can also breed misunderstandings. Ruby thinks Ellen is insisting she shows her true self because she might have been surprised by her sudden appearance. In her mind, Ruby thinks that her goal is not to attain liking, but to be labeled as harmless as possible. Ruby deliberates the common misconception of her being misunderstood and she will try not to let others think wrong for her. Ellen guides her to her room and upon entering, Ruby stares at her room in utter disbelief. It's a lavish royal room, decorated by Ellen herself. Ruby also wanted a room with a sea view. It's like a dream come true for her. Ellen lets Ruby rest after a strenuous day and exists the room. Later in the night, Ruby wakes up shivering in the cold, the flame has gone out, and now it's extremely cold inside. Ruby ponders who on earth can do such a childish act to her, something in the face of a maid glaring at her earliest crosses her mind. Ruby cautiously gets up in the dark to light up the room, but she suddenly trembles in fear staring at her window. Fear engulfs Ruby and the sight in front of her has frozen her sense. Ruby falls to the ground seeing the dreadful monster in her window. She wants to shout or move herself, but her reflexes have frozen by the fear. Suddenly, a maid enters inside and shouts to the fullest of her throat. Helen enters the room and Isaac follows her, and with his fine swing of the sword, Isaac splits the demon into half. Ruby opens her eyes. She is baffled by the incident and finds Isaac standing above her glaring at Ruby. Their eyes collide and Isaac probes the reason for turning off the torch. The already terrified Ruby cannot process his question and dumbfoundedly looks at Isaac. She tries to clarify that she has not turned off the torch, but Isaac does not seem to believe in her explanations a bit. Isaac accuses Ruby of doing this act for attention-seeking purposes. Ruby had already expected Isaac to hate her, but she was not expecting him such a dreadful impression on Isaac. Ellen rises in her support and asks her brother not to make inferences in a rush. She does not think Ruby is behind turning off the torch. After all, there are no such incidents ever recorded in the South, which marks Ruby completely unaware of the complexities here in the North. To settle down the matter, Ruby hides behind Ellen and clarifies that when she wakes up, the light in the room was already off. Isaac takes a dig at Ruby, who could be it? My sister, or me? To settle down the matter, Ruby takes the blame of turning off the torch on her head and apologies for the reckless behavior with teary eyes. Seeing the tear in her eyes calms Isaac's piling anger. He turns to Ruby to inquire about something, but sheds the thought at the last moment and departs, leaving Ruby wondering what the question really was. The following morning, Ellen joins Ruby for breakfast. However, Ruby's apprehension lingers as she fears that eating anything might trigger a bout of nausea, a lingering effect from the events of the past. She yearns for it all to be nothing more than a mere dream, but sadly, the harsh reality confirms that it is anything but a mere illusion. Ellen affirms that Ruby will not have to wake up due to cold anymore. Deep down, Ruby knows that Ellen has been aware of the real culprit all this while. Ellen informs her regarding court's banquet which is going to be held in four days from today and ensures her thorough cooperation with Ruby if she desires. Ruby asks to get her a seamstress since her clothes are designed according to the Southern traditions and because summer in the North is very short, Ruby thinks she may need new dresses real soon. While everyone is betting on the wedding being called off soon, Ruby is dedicated to dressing up and making a good impression of herself. Nevertheless, she is acutely aware that the events of yesterday have left a deep and unfavorable impression on her husband. Recognizing the need to swiftly mend the damage caused, she resolves to erase the stains of yesterday. The only reason behind her visit to the church after Ellen's advice is to understand her husband and eventually not get killed by her husband in the near future. Ruby understands that she has to look as harmless as possible. It is her backup plan even if she fails to prevent Ellen's marriage. In the novel, Elenia was poisoned because she was engaged to the Prince of Doria's kingdom. It was because Pope never liked the prince. On top of that, the assassination of the Borgia family was an open secret in the town. 
Everyone suspected Polka poisoning the princess. Moreover, the recklessness in the murder further contributed to the suspicions. Presently, if Ruby unearths the poisoning plan earlier, Pope's spies will be all over Ellendale, and even if she gets caught joking about the incident, she will immediately be taken back to the south. In the church, one of the knights who accompanied Redbeckia addresses her from behind and Redbeckia, who is deeply lost in her thoughts, shocks by the voice. The knight probes the reason for her presence, and Ruby replies that she came to see her husband. The knight asks her to wait and immediately heads to Isaac, telling him about his wife. Suddenly, Isaac pops up from behind, inquiring about her purpose of visit. Clinching her fingers in hesitation, Ruby deliberates that she came to see him, thinking that she offended her husband in the morning. Isaac, on the contrary, turns back unbothered and asks her to leave. Driven by impulse, Ruby reaches out to grab Isaac from behind, inadvertently causing her to lose her grip on the sacred basket she held. With a sense of urgency, she quickly stoops down to gather the fallen fruits, her hands moving swiftly to retrieve them from the ground. Isaac, on the contrary, is not pleased by her hastiness and probes her why is she even bothering to pick up the dropped fruit. Gutted by her humiliation, Ruby picks up the fruit with teary eyes and apologizes to Isaac for the inconvenience she has caused him. However, it's all part of her top-notch acting. She has learned a lot in the past years. Keeping the follow of her act intact, Ruby utters the fears engulfing her. She has been hearing this on and off that Isaac hates her. And now he is considering divorcing Ruby. Isaac, on the contrary, clarifies that he does not hate or resent Ruby. Realizing that her tears have failed to elicit the desired response, Ruby swiftly adjusts her approach. Drawing upon her ability to appear innocent and naive, she employs this tactic in front of Isaac. To her relief, Isaac takes notice and kindly picks up the dropped fruit, assuring Ruby that she need not stress herself with the task of bringing the fruit to him anymore. Isaac alters the tone and coldly tells Ruby that he does not like to communicate with unintelligent people and she must consider a write-up request to go home. Ruby thought her acts will have some impact on Isaac, but she was wrong. Isaac is not someone who flows in emotions quickly. But if she keeps acting naive and innocent like this, she is certain that Isaac won't consider her a suspect in the murder either. Without a second thought, Ruby shouts to the fullest of her throat, confessing her love for Isaac, and the entire hall turns up on its head. Isaac might get such a confession and routine for his looks and his popularity, but she can't help herself confessing her love. Recalling Isaac's assistance from the previous day, Ruby asserts that no confession is necessary from his side. She playfully probes, questioning whether Isaac, as her husband, cannot extend a helping hand to both his wife and devoted admirer. In an attempt to create a scenario where an ordinary girl falls for a handsome guy who remains unfazed by her presence. However, to her dismay, her seemingly unbothered husband walks to the door without paying the slightest attention to her playful act. The seamstress has prepared exquisite dresses for Ruby, who has not been able to come across since the confession. All this while Ellen has also been busy with summer preparation, on the banquet day, Ellen finds her sister-in-law dressed in a graceful attire. Ruby can't believe that a beauty like Ellen will soon be married to a rather plain-looking prince and pledges to save her in the future. Dozed in her thoughts, Ruby could not realize the presence of a third person amongst them. It was Ellen's best friend, Freya Van Furiana. Ruby extends a warm greeting to the Lady Furiana. Seeing Freya glare at her dress, Ruby wonders if something is wrong with her attire, as she is new to such dresses. Ellen apologizes to Ruby for keeping her waiting for Isaac, who seems to be late like always. However, Ruby hopes that she will see Isaac at the banquet at least. Their carriage reaches the palace of Aglaben, and they enter a gloomy hall filled with nobles. It reminds her that in the banquets at Romagna, her home, the sole reason for approaching Ruby was to build ties with her father or brothers. She was the object of reverence for others, but Ruby fears the outcomes if her true identity is unveiled. By the way, she appears nothing but a child caught among the nobles of the north. A man strides towards Ruby, inquiring about the Pope, he is Omura's knight. The knight reiterates his question and further inquires when Cardinal Valentino will be visiting Arundel. Ellen approaches to save Ruby from being further mocked. Freya finds Isaac in the hall and excitedly waves at him. Ruby knew that Isaac will concord lies about his late arrival to avoid Ruby. Freya and Ellen think they should go and scold Isaac for leaving behind his wife, but before they could take a step, Ruby swiftly strides towards her husband, clenching her hands in anger. Guided by the haste, Isaac's rudeness towards her, and the rumors of her marriage being called off, she approaches Isaac. Ruby understands that she might get humiliated, but she does not care a bit. As soon as she approaches Isaac, her expressions alter drastically. Ruby has replaced her anger with a warm smile. Even with the fire inside her, Ruby can't let herself drain emotions. Isaac looks down on her and remarks that she does not have much sense of appearance. She apologizes for interrupting, but had she not done so, Isaac would not have bothered seeing her. 
Exuding an air of care and consideration for Isaac's peace of mind, Ruby affirms that henceforth she will only express her love from a distance, respecting his boundaries. Satisfied with her performance, she swiftly shifts her attention back to the girls. Isaac grabs her from behind in and coldly asks Ruby to reiterate her words and she does so. Isaac turns red, irritated with her fangirl behavior. Ruby acts as if she is terrified to death and in an impediment speech. Ruby describes that she wants to see him but does not wish to irritate him either. Agonized by her expression of love, Isaac refers to her clinginess as a suicide attempt. Seeing the matter getting out of hand, Isaac's friends intervene to ease the environment. Ruby strives to escape from his firm grip and ensures that she will not cause any trouble for Isaac. Unpleased with Isaac's behavior, Ellen coldly informs him to wait for them on the departure. Just when Isaac intends to snub his wife for the mess, the announcement of the arrival emperor abstains him. The Emperor of Britannia, Fenol enters the banquet, the Emperor approaches Ruby and thanks her for her presence in the banquet. The Emperor maintains that it's quite rare to see Isaac in a banquet and considers it an impact on his marriage. In the background, the maids laugh at Ruby's misery for being abandoned by her husband. The Emperor has not been pleased by his nephew's remarks either. The young Princess Arian also welcomes Ruby to the abandoned palace in her cute voice and Rebecca responds to her warm welcome with equal enthusiasm. The queen hails from an eastern slave, the king loves his wife and daughter a lot, and the young princess is not the biological cousin of Isaac. Arian, who has an appearance of pagan, does not belong to this elite class of nobles, though Ruby does not have much to do with her. She has her own survival as her primal focus. While Ruby boasts about a delicious banquet, Freya says that she went to Isaac to bring him to the table, but he did not consider her suggestion. The girls ponder Ruby's experience of horse riding. Ruby maintains that she likes the riding, but she is not much skilled in it. Though it's a blatant lie in her past life, Ruby was taught plenty of sports for nobles, but she does not have good memories associated with most of them. The girls suggest that Ruby should ask her husband since it's normal for a husband to help his wife. Frey claims to have a natural talent for horse riding, staring at each other with mocking eyes. Ruby's relationship with Freya is quite interesting after all. However, Ruby does not care about her terms with anyone. She only aspires to save her neck. Ruby believes as a responsible wife, she must waste her husband's time in such useless activity. Freya reveals that a fencing tournament is around the corner and she wonders if Isaac will take part in this. Freya is confident that if Isaac takes part in the competition, the winner will be determined before the proceedings. On the flip side, Ruby is worried that Caesar will also be coming to the north to attend the competition. It's a deadly competition where only nobles are allowed to take part. The player fights with the deadly monsters in life-risking matches and incident prevention group is also created to prevent any mishaps in the oldest and the largest event in the history of this continent. A lot of participants, including the priests, will take part in the contest, including Caesar. Drinking on an empty stomach makes Ruby dizzy, and on top of that she can't puke in the presence of a huge crow. Unable to maintain her balance, Ruby collides with Lorenzo, seeing her unable to keep a hold of herself. Lorenzo offers his assistance to take her back to the party. Ruby can sense a clear hostility in his approach, making her feel suffocated. Even her husband Isaac has not stared at Ruby like this. Ruby inquires if they have ever met and Lorenzo negates such an event, though Ruby is quite famous and no one in the North who does not know her. Ruby is surprised to hear this since she has always thought that her brothers are the only famous children of Pop. Lorenzo reveals that one of his famous songs is written for Ruby. Curious Ruby asks him to sing the song, which however sounds much like a banter. Isaac interrupts the awful song and shouts at Lorenzo for his reckless behavior to the lady. Being a senior, he orders Lorenzo to immediately apologize for his impertinence. Ivan apologizes on behalf of the short-sighted and delusional Lorenzo. Ruby quickly overlooks Lorenzo's words. It's not the first time she's come across this gossip, but the worst part is Isaac's belief in this gossip and she burst into tears saying this. Ivan clarifies that her husband does not care about what others say and he does not let anyone disturb him so easily, which means that he just does not hate Rebecca. Ivan's kind words lift Ruby's confidence as her famous smile covers her face again. Although it's tough for her to believe in what Ivan said, but if it's true, it brings a glimmer of hope to Ruby. She now seems confident to achieve what she desires. However, amidst all this, Ruby ponders why Lorenzo had been acting weird to her, and if his hostile attitude has anything to do with Freya. Strolling in the park, Ruby comes across Princess Arian who has been hiding from her parents. The cute princess begs Ruby not to tell anyone about her presence. As Ruby walks past the princess, the young princess thoughtlessly probes what is Ruby walking alone when she's meant to be with her husband. The princess cutely reveals that there is a love fairy residing in the lake inside the palace. She hears her nanny saying this once. 
A young princess suggests that she can offer Ruby the opportunity to enjoy the splendid banquet she has prepared, on the condition that Ruby allows her to play with her hair. With a joyful expression, Ruby readily agrees. Suddenly, Isaac appears from behind and frets the young princess. The princess holds on to Ruby in fear as Isaac stares at her with a dreadful look and instructs her to immediately head inside. Isaac maintains that his wife and the young princess are absolute replicas of not adhering to the bits of advice. In fact, Isaac has not come looking for the princess but for Ruby, his wife. Isaac closes on Ruby, further petrifying Ruby who is already scared while surrounded by Isaac's probing eyes in a lonely place. Seeing her shiver in a fret, Isaac probes if Ruby also grew up in an abusive family. Inside her heart, Ruby asserts that it's common to fret when a cold heart knight walks this close to a naive girl. Isaac reiterates Ruby's desire to observe him from a distance and Ruby affirms her agreement with that sentiment. Curious, Isaac probes further, asking what prompted her to close her eyes whenever he approached her closely. She has been caught up in a complicated situation and a reckless reply here can land Ruby in trouble. She quickly thinks of the options and maintains that Ruby felt she angered her husband, therefore she closed her eyes in fear. She goes on to clarify that she will still love him even if he hits her because Isaac was the first person to save her. A knight hurries at the sight of Isaac and asks him to come along. Just when Ruby thought she escaped the situation, Isaac turns back and asks her to wait. She waits for Isaac while carrying the Rebecca flowers in her hand. Those with a similar name as her and Rebecca ironically means eternal happiness. Suddenly she fails to maintain her balance and Ruby falls on her back in the water. She falls into the cold water engulfed in thoughts that this is her end. Strangely, she does not feel scared. Ruby ponders about the black shadows encircling her body like they are teasing her. She tries to escape but fails. Struggling for breath, Ruby finds herself on the verge of despair, convinced that her end is near. In a moment of desperation, a hand reaches out towards her, offering salvation, and pulls her out of the water. Panicked by the presence of the guests around her in numbers, she wonders what happened to her and how she fell into the water. Ruby thinks it's the monster who threw her into the water. She can't believe how the monster managed to enter the capital. But the most important problem is Isaac standing in front of her, glaring at her in wrath. Without letting him a moment to think of the past incident, Ruby immediately hugs Isaac with teary eyes, thanking him for saving her life. The next morning, Ruby wakes up in the mansion. The maid brings her breakfast, but already nauseous Ruby denies to have breakfast. The maid informs that Ellen has been away since morning and after the maid's exit, Ruby soothes herself with a hot water shower, thinking about yesterday's incident. It's caused huge unrest in the palace, which is now heavily guarded. The sudden appearance of the monster in the king's residence has caused panic all over the Crendel. The event happened in an identical pattern to the mansion. Ruby ponders why she is the only one affected by the sudden appearance. She fears that if the trend continues, the people in Crendel may begin considering her a witch who can call on monsters. After falling into the lake, Ruby has been experiencing worsened symptoms like the scorching feeling of being pricked by needles. Even since she incarnated in this body, she only had the symptoms twice a year. The doctors tried their best to recognize the underlying problem but failed. Ruby never showed any symptoms of fever and chill. Etc. As a consequence, the Pope accused Ruby of attempting to trick him in order to cancel her engagement. With the passage of time, Ruby got used to the pain. Ruby wishes that Isaac does not call on a doctor and doubt her for cheating like the Pope. Moreover, continuous rest has improved her overall condition. What bothers Ruby is Isaac's drastic change in attitude towards her. Isaac even waited the entire night, keeping his word with Ruby. Interestingly, a bunch of armored knights has been positioned outside Ruby's room. She inquires them about her husband but apologizes to reveal anything, but her teary eyes convince them to take Ruby to the Elmo's port, where she enthusiastically looks for her husband. Secretly peering into the place where Isaac is supposed to be staying, Ruby anticipates that he must be occupied with a conference or some other important matter. However, to her surprise, she discovers Isaac indulging in the company of his friends enjoying one glass of beer after another. Flushed with embarrassment, Ruby's heart races relentlessly, pounding as if it wants to break free from her chest. Her pulse quickens further as she realizes she has been caught in the act of stalking Isaac by a vigilant knight. The same knight who interrupted their chat yesterday at the banquet. The knight apologizes for startling Ruby. Despite his stalking, the knight does not entail threatening vibes like Lorenzo. He rather seems to be a kind subordinate. Out of curiosity, Ruby inquires the knight about his service for Isaac, who responds that he has been recently appointed because the previous knight was sacked for his obscene song for Lord Isaac. Ruby instantly realizes that Lorenzo is being discussed here. She wonders why he tried to trick Ruby then. Ruby pretends that she did not come to see Isaac specifically, and that she was rather passing by when she came across this place. The knight in response insists that Ruby must see her husband, otherwise Sir Isaac will be sad. 
Ruby, on the contrary, does not seem to believe that a cold-hearted person like Isaac can ever be sad. The Meg is confident that Isaac does find her special because Isaac never asks any woman to wait for him, though he requests Rebecca to keep it to herself. The knight does not want Isaac to ever find out that he made such revelations about Isaac. When asked about his presence, the knight maintains that he has been assigned the duty to watch over the place since the last monster outbreak. Like always, Isaac appears behind Ruby and his voice sends shivers down their spines. Following his friend Isaac, Ivan joins the scene where Endymion and Rebecca stand, their expressions mirroring those of convicted criminals caught in the act. Isaac, Ruby's husband. Ivan anxiously inquires about Ruby's well-being while Isaac glares at his best friend. Unbothered by Isaac's response, Ruby thanks him for saving her life yesterday. Though it was a common thing for Isaac, Ruby's death could have caused trouble for many. Ivan invites Rebecca for lunch. Ruby hesitates before accepting the offer, but Ivan's insistence convinces her to accept the offer. In a sudden turn of events, Ivan's finger points directly at Ruby's nosebleed, unintentionally highlighting her rather awkward appearance. Isaac, concerned, queries whether Ruby is all right and why she seems so weak. Agonizing over Ruby's well-being, Isaac expresses his worry and frustration, chastising her for venturing out of the palace without informing anyone, especially in such a depleted state of health. Ruby tries to calm Isaac and maintains that it is merely dizziness, and she is fine, but Isaac does not look convinced by her explanation. Their health concerns are justified, she bears a pain that top medics of the Empire fail to fail reason. Ruby considers it a side effect of entering someone else's body, but Isaac tells her that her body is as hot as a stove. Eventually, the dizziness gets better of Ruby as she falls unconscious. Ruby wakes up to a mournful cry, she wonders if it's Elenia or someone from the maids. She wakes up with a heavy head and walks up to the door. Her entire focus is on the mourn she heard a while ago. As Ruby cautiously opens the door, her eyes meet with the doctor's penetrating gaze which unleashes a whirlwind of uncertainty and apprehension within her. Their intense stare ignites a storm of a thousand thoughts and emotions in Ruby's mind. Ruby insists that she has heard someone crying all this while but both men deny hearing mourning. She got worried thinking that it can be Ellen. Even after Isaac's continuous denial, Ruby still stresses that she is not lying. The doctor takes leave and informs them about his visit tomorrow, and suddenly, after Sergei's exit, Isaac lifts her on his shoulders and takes Ruby inside. Ruby resists out of embarrassment, but it's no use. Isaac does not bother her blabbering. Ruby inquires about her nosebleed, and Isaac responds that she did have a continuous nosebleed three days ago, to Ruby's shock. It has been three days since she collapsed. Ruby thanks Isaac for taking care of her in the past day and reiterates her request that Isaac should not hate her. Caught in the grip of fever, Ruby's words become increasingly outlandish as she expresses her genuine admiration for Isaac's skills. However, in response to her delirious state, Isaac gently leaves her on the bed and departs. She has been taken so blandly since her collapse the other day. As an effect of the common cold, Ruby still had a fever for the coming two days. The doctor has advised the house to take care of Ruby's eating habits, otherwise such collapse can recur. However, Ruby concludes that her cold is an after-effect of her fall in the pond the other day. The nosebleed and Isaac's growing concerns are understandable, yet worrisome for Rebecca. She has been locked in the room and Ellen is on duty to keep an eye on her sister-in-law during the meal so she does not skip any meal. One day, Ellen expresses that she was so shocked to hear about Ruby's collapse, Ruby apologizes for creating such inconvenience for the house, it was equally sudden for Ruby too. Ellen describes the incident as her negligence, however, it was the first time when Ellen saw her brother panic for someone. But more importantly, Ruby has recovered quicker than Ellen's anticipation. She invites Ruby to join her and Freya on the horse riding. Both friends go to an equestrian group every summer and Ruby understands that accompanying her to the group can be a great opportunity for Ruby to make a good impression in the elite society. The next day, Ruby gifts the maid with one of the jewelry that Caesar gave her in regards to taking care of her during her ailing days. Ruby probes about how long the head maid has worked here and the young maid reveals that she has been serving in the house for years. The head maid has been taking care of the kids since they were young. Horse riding in the north is a perfect excuse for the nobles to meet and build intimacy. The underlying goal of arranging such events is to get along and find a lover. And there is nothing in the group here, it's a kind of social club for the nobles. Ruby did not leave a good mark in the banquet, however, she aspires to make a name for herself in the group. Lady Freya approaches Ruby, Freya deliberates that she was very anxious about Ruby's health, and it's very pleasing for her to find Ruby healthy and recovered. In response, Ruby thanks her for the words maintaining that there was nothing inconvenient if Freya desired to visit her. Ruby clenches her fists in anger because everyone here thinks she stole Freya's place. However, Ellen says that all horses here are well-trained and Ruby can freely choose any of them for riding, except for those barns on the right they are specific for Isaac. 
Freya remarks that it's not easy for Ruby to ride just after recovering. Ellen also sides with Freya and calls for the gentlest course. Ruby is not pleased with such discrimination. She hears the footsteps behind, and it's Isaac. Ellen and Freya playfully jest at Isaac, teasingly mentioning that they have an appointment with his wife for the day, but he is more than welcome to join them if he so desires. Isaac has a day off for today, so he has no activity for the entire day. Ruby invites Isaac to join her for the horse riding, but he plainly refuses. Ruby ignores Isaac and asks the girls if she can choose a horse. Isaac inquires whether she is skilled at horse riding, and Ruby denies it. That is the reason she has been asking to come along. Ellen graciously takes Freya with her, giving them the opportunity to spend some quality time together. Meanwhile, Ruby seats with frustration at being left alone with the seemingly arrogant Isaac. Ruby apologizes to Isaac and turns back to home, but he suddenly stops her and asks Sidic to leave the place. Now it's only two of them inside. The truth is Ruby hates the stables, not just in this life, but in her previous life too. She quickly pulls herself out of the traumas of her past life. Ruby can't let her past life incidents ruin her work. Isaac calls her back and asks her to over the thing. Ruby fears that Isaac may hit her up like her past, but at Isaac begins introducing her to the horses instead. Overwhelmed by her emotions, Ruby humbly lowers herself before Isaac and pleads for his forgiveness. Tears well up in her eyes as she confesses that she has committed a grave sin, her words laced with deep remorse and regret. Isaac firmly discards the whip, determined not to let Ruby's past continue to haunt her. Observing Ruby's psychological distress, she begins to speak incoherently, burdened by the weight of her inner struggles. Isaac reassures her that the whip holds no significance to him and that it is all a product of her own thoughts. However, Witnessing Ruby's deep anguish, Isaac gently pulls her closer to himself, seeking to comfort and calm her troubled senses. He understands that her fear and anxiety stem from a traumatic past, and he endeavors to provide the support and solace she needs. Ruby desires to proceed with the horse riding, though Isaac hesitates to go for riding in her present condition, but Ruby insists that she would like to experience the horse riding so she can get to know the people here. Isaac hands her an apple to bribe his horses. His horses are very prone to bribing and they immediately forget who the owner is after they are served with food, she hesitantly offers the apple to the horse. Surprisingly, the horse begins liking her, Isaac calls for Cedric and asks him to prepare the horse for them. To Ruby's shock, Isaac decides to join her for the ride. She is excited to be part of the ride with him, but asks him the reason for leaving behind his busy schedule, but Isaac abstains to answer her and proceeds with the ride. Deep down in her, Ruby is very satisfied with her recent progress. A man who did not bother to see her is now accompanying her. Though she has to keep trying to maintain his interest, everyone in the house is shocked to see Isaac on the horse with a girl. It's a sight that no one expected to ever come across. On the flip side, Ruby can feel Isaac's bloodthirsty eyes probing her. It's never easy to stay composed in such an awkward situation. As they pass Ellen, she can't stop herself from questioning Isaac and what is he up to, who responds that he is making up for Ellen's mess. Ellen is not pleased with his remarks. She stops Isaac from blaming her for his own attitude. Ellen mocks him for his rude attitude and asks Isaac to behave decently with the father too. Ruby dumbfoundedly witnesses their argument and the rising tension senses that the siblings may quarrel any moment. Freya intervenes to ease the environment and shouts at both of them to stop quarreling. Freya asks Isaac to stop escalating the argument. He has the lady by his side and he must carry on with her. Ruby leans herself on her husband and requests Isaac not to get angry. She does not want his handsome face to ruin. Easing the tension, Ruby thanks her husband for bringing her. She has been absolutely overwhelmed by the event, and deep down Ruby thinks how tough it is to put up an act every day. The maid calls Ruby inside where everyone is waiting for her at the tea. Ruby is intrigued why the essentials have turtles endorsed all over it. Ellen breaks her spell of thoughts when she apologizes for the earlier brawl of the siblings. Amidst the fight, Ruby is adamant that they should not have left Isaac alone. At the table, Ellen's friend probes Ruby's well-being. She expresses how shocked she was hearing about her collapse. It appears that Ellen's friend is attempting to embarrass Ruby in front of others, as her friend takes a dig at Ruby's eating habits, suggesting that her restricted diet is a result of her excessive concern for her body. The common aims to tease Ruby and draw attention to her choices, creating an uncomfortable moment for her. In response, Ruby acts as not to be a nuisance. She thanks her for being so considerate about Ruby's health. Ruby further inquires if she can consult her in the future. Actually, Ruby's witty replies have taken her out of the embarrassing situation. Ellen changes the topic. She looks offended, too, by the present situation. Freya expresses her displeasure with Ellen's earlier brawl with Isaac. Even her sister Lauren acts Lee sometimes, but quarreling is not always the option. Freya curiously asks Ruby about her brothers. Ruby responds that putting up childish acts is normal in siblings. 
Freya asserts that Ruby must be missing her siblings so much though in reality, Ruby does not have many sweet memories to miss those jerks back in Romagna. Freya goes on to inquire when Caesar will be visiting the north. There is a match in the late Ottoman and Caesar is quite famous among the young nobles. Freya tells Ruby not to be worried about Lauren's clinginess she has been after Isaac for a long. Ruby laughs back saying that it's normal for a wife who has such a handsome husband. To Ellen's surprise, Ruby is very kind-hearted. She thought Ruby is quite hard to approach because she is Romagna's princess. Despite all the praise from Freya, she thinks of the character Redbeckia. If her past was not miserable, she would have not made the stupid choice of traveling north. They have come a little far in consideration of her two monster experiences. Ruby probes if it's fine to travel this far, and Freya assures that this place is completely safe for outings. Freya applauds Ruby's horse riding skills and invites her to take part in the equestrian competition with her. Whoever goes straight and arrives at the destination opposite the road first may win the competition. Ruby grabs on the opportunity to build better ties with Ellen and accepts the challenge. As an advantage of familiarity with the place, Freya allows Ruby to head first running freely without being watched and motivated to showcase her true abilities. Ruby does not realize that she has come so far. When she looks back, Ruby does not find Freya around. The fear engulfs her when Ruby is surrounded by the similar black aura of the monster. Ruby opens her eyes in the jungle. Unaware of the surrounding, she dusts herself up and just when she begins to leave, Ruby comes across a raccoon. The admirable-looking raccoon suddenly transforms into a terrifying sight as it lets out a bone-chilling roar directed at Ruby. Its once cute appearance is now distorted, its mouth reveals a horrifying sight of jagged teeth and a macabre display of skeletal remains. The shocking transformation leaves Ruby filled with fear and unease. The raccoon hides Ruby with her behind a stone from the approaching threat. The sight sends chills down her spine. It's a headless knight on a horse looking for a human to feed on. Luckily, the demon goes past them without even noticing their presence. It turns out that raccoon has saved Ruby from the monster. Shockingly, the raccoon can understand her language. Ruby asks the raccoon another favor. She wants him to guide her on the way home since she is lost in the middle of the jungle. The raccoon turns his back towards Ruby, allowing her to climb on the raccoon. The soft and fluffy looking raccoon does not spare a moment and rushes towards the city with Ruby on his back. On the flip side, the knights are anxiously looking for Ruby all over the jungle. Suddenly, they come across a sound in the surroundings and to a pleasant surprise, Endymion finds the Lady Redbeckia. Covered in a layer of dust, dirt, and bloodstains, Ruby finds herself surrounded by concern as Ivan anxiously inquires about her well-being. However, before Ivan can fully attend to her, he is pushed aside by Isaac, who approaches Ruby with a mixture of worry and frustration. His eyes glare with intensity, reflecting his distress over her reckless behavior and the constant trouble she seems to find herself in. Ruby's heart skips a beat as she locks eyes with Isaac, feeling a deep sense of fear that she might face dire consequences at any moment. Overwhelmed by the looming threat, Ruby stumbles backward, her entire being consumed by the terror of what could come next. Stand up, Isaac's voice roars in the jungle, giving a shut-up call to the knights speaking in her favor. Isaac is confident that she has done this all to attain Isaac's attention. Isaac lifts her in the arms, first, they should take care of her wounds and then talks about the trouble she caused. Unaware of what is running in Isaac's mind, she finds real comfort in his arms as he takes Ruby back to the palace on his horse. Ruby opens her eyes and finds Isaac looking at her with care plundering him his eyes. Isaac tells her that she fell asleep on her way home. Isaac asks her to explain the matter and and Ruby narrates the entire incident from their competition to running into the bushes where Ruby injured her ankle and while pulling herself up, something hit her in the head and she passed out. Ruby intentionally skips the part with Monster Popo. Shockingly, Isaac has been misguided by Freya about the incident. She lied to Isaac that Ruby ran freely by her own choice on the contrary. Freya tried to stop her, but she did not listen to Freya. Ruby turns on her head by the false story. She does not understand what took Freya to Concord such a baseless story. Was it because Freya did not want to kill her or was her entire motive to kill her everything was fine between the two till the incident? Suddenly, Isaac gets up from his chair. He asks Ruby to pack her things and head back to Romagna. He will let her go unconditionally. Though Ruby had anticipated that she will one day be divorced, it was not supposed to happen so soon. Even the rigid families of Romagna don't call off their marriages so soon, but they rather give it some time. Ruby is termed a hostage by the royal family of Britannia. They can keep her as long as they may desire to milk benefits from Romagna, but shockingly, Isaac is letting her go back unconditionally. It is worth mentioning that Isaac is the emperor's nephew, not some nobody in the country. If this happens, a Rebecca has to head back. This would mean that Ellen would be forced to marry Prince Norias. There will be none to protect her death against the spies already planted in the city to eliminate her. 
Isaac deliberates that there is no purpose for her stay since he does not desire to marry her. Ruby shouts, no, I don't want to go back. She sits on Isaac's feet, pleading to let her stay here. She is ready to endure any punishment for her wrongdoings, and Ruby is ready to pay back for her acts. Isaac grinds his teeth in anger. He can't take it anymore. Isaac bursts out saying that you are so annoying. I hate you so much. Isaac expected her to act arrogant, but she prefers acting fool all over the place. He does not understand why he cares about Ruby so much that he went all out in the middle of the jungle to save her. This means that Ruby's efforts have paid off to the extent that she has managed to develop feelings in Isaac's heart. Ruby pledges that she will do anything for Isaac and he should not leave her. After Isaac leaves the room, Ruby thinks about the incident. Frey of Imperiana, the famous noble lady of the Krendal, the novel was mainly focused on the House Borgia and House Omerta. There is not much information about her in love, but every time she got in trouble with Rebecca, she acted wisely. Ruby thought that acting differently from the novel will make things easier for her, even though it was dangerous. Initially, Freya showed no hostility towards Ruby, but maybe the once nobody is now a sore her eyes. Greed can make people do silly things after all. Later, Freya approaches Ruby and apologizes for her actions. She maintains that Isaac's anger made her lie. Inside her heart, although Ruby remains unconvinced by the insincere apology, she chooses to maintain a facade of kindness and let go of the matter. Deep down, she understands that life is unpredictable, and no one can foresee what the next moments may bring. Despite the underlying tension, Ruby finds solace in being able to witness Krendel's beauty up close. Ruby's words lift Freya's mood. She smiles back at Ruby and offers to be present for her help whenever Ruby may desire. In Freya's presence, Ruby is a figure no one would care about, but it is from the past now. Although, no one would believe her if Ruby says that Freya is jealous of her because Freya is considered better than her in every discipline. The only person who pretends to believe in her is her husband, and he has not been seen since yesterday. At the dining table, Ellen tells her about the forthcoming birthday of her husband. When Ruby asks to help, Ellen says that there is no need for her to help them out since everything will flow in the already decided pattern. Moreover, Ellen will be busy for the coming days, so she has asked the servant to prepare the things according to Ruby's desire. Fortunately, Lucille, the maid who received the bribe, helped her. With her husband's birthday around the corner, she does not have much to offer. Ruby pulls out the essentials for Needlepoint, unaware that the head maid had been looking at her for a while. The headmaid suggests that if Ruby is good at sewing, she should sew a willow tree. In Isaac's childhood, he used to climb a willow tree, and even now sometimes he gets sad that the tree is no more. Although Ruby does not know much about Lady Omerta's death, she still remembers the tragic scene. And headmaid is asking her to sew a willow tree to further agonize her husband. Now Ruby is almost certain that it was the headmaid who turned off the torch, and she's after Ruby. She decides to write a letter to her husband, but suddenly the pain episode comes back, Ruby somehow managed to call the maid. The head maid reveals that she has orders to keep Ruby in the room and don't let her enter the party. Lucille brings her painkiller. She asks Lucille to call Ellen here, but Lucille describes that Ellen is out and she will come back at the banquet. Moments ago, the head maid offered to Ruby instead of Lucille, but she can't trust the head maid at all. But Ruby fears what would happen when the head maid's words turn true. How would Isaac react? She does not want to believe it, but Ruby fears that Isaac may not bother her existence from here on. Ruby asserts that Ellen must have known how her present condition is, therefore she did not call Ruby for the banquet. But Ruby is confident to go and attend the banquet, even if she is sick. She rings the bell and calls Lucille. Ruby bribes her with a ring and in return asks Lucille to help her out preparing for the banquet. Lucille hesitates, but the greed of such an expensive gift impels her to help Ruby. Lucille reiterates that Ruby will have to come back sooner and Ruby agrees. So finally, as things stand, Ruby has managed to escape from the party. As she heads towards the party, the rain begins at the very same moment, and Ruby is now completely wet in the rain. Her gift is also wet. Amidst the cheerful chatter of the people celebrating Isaac's birthday, Ruby can only watch from a distance, unable to join in the festivities. Isaac is surrounded by the nobles, basking in their attention and admiration. Freya presents him with an exquisite gift, its opulence and beauty outshining the simplicity of the gift Ruby has brought. Despite her sincere intentions, Ruby's gift pales in comparison to the extravagant offerings surrounding Isaac, leaving her feeling somewhat disheartened. She is the uninvited guest here, and even if she appears in her present appearance, she will be deemed nothing more than a disgrace. Ruby does go back to her room, and on her way back, she smashes her shoulder into Lorenzo. The pain of her collision runs across her shoulder, but Ruby is still caught up by the scenes at the banquet. Consumed by feelings of worthlessness, Ruby finds herself in a state of agony, questioning her existence. She reaches out to Lorenzo, inviting him to unleash his curses upon her, believing that perhaps she deserves the humiliation that surrounds her. 
Ruby wipes off her tears and maintains that Lorenzo and his sister should not be worried about her existence anymore. Lost in her tears, Ruby did not realize that she is being continuously watched by Isaac. Ruby fears that Isaac will shout at her and embarrass her for leaving the room on her own in the rain. She immediately turns back to her room, but she stumbles in haste and falls on her face. The weight of embarrassment is palpable on Ruby's face, her cheeks flushed with shame. Tears well up in her eyes as Isaac lifts her gently and she can no longer contain her emotions. Amidst her sobs, she apologizes profusely for venturing out of her room without permission. She explains that her sole purpose was to present him with the carefully prepared gift she had intended for his birthday. Ruby assures him that she has no ulterior motives for flirting or seeking attention. Despite being fully aware that Isaac may not want her presence at the banquet, she simply wanted to express her heartfelt gesture through the gift. Her words are filled with sincerity as she hopes he can understand her genuine intentions amidst her tearful apology. Isaac stares at her in disbelief. It turns out that the maid has been lying and Isaac did not put any condition. Ivan bursts at Lorenzo in anger, and fretted Lorenzo clarifies that he only sang the obscene song once. Ivan warns him to kill him if he ever sings the song again. Song? What song? Isaac curiously asks them, has it happened previously when Endymion told Ruby that he got the place because Lorenzo sang an obscene song for Isaac? So actually it was Ivan who heard the song and kept Isuk away from hearing such a humiliating song. It looks like Ruby has caught a cold. Isu carries her inside the banquet, where he asks Ellen to take Ruby back to her room and bring her prepared for the banquet. Ellen anxiously looks at Ruby's rusty look and asks what happened to her in the first place. Ellen reveals that she was informed that Ruby is not in the shape to attend the banquet, and when she came to see her, her complexion was pale, so she only knew that her sister-in-law was clearly unwell. Ruby assures that she is now feeling a lot better, and it's just a menstrual cramp she was on to tell Ellen that Ruby was asked not to come out for the banquet. Ruby impulsively asks who the hell said this and Ruby looks at the head maid. However, Ellen first calls for the painkillers. Though Rebecca has entered the banquet late, she comes across the young princess straight away. Upon inquiring, the prince tells that she is here with the nanny because her mother usually does not visit such places. Ruby comes to think of the fact that since the queen is a slave, that is why she avoids she probe in gatherings. A cute little girl joins their conversation. She talks about her paladin brother who is quite famous for his heroics but he is really a bad person inside laughing at her introduction. Ruby quickly realizes that she is Eamon's sister. The young girls ask Ruby if they can touch her hair and Ruby happily allows them to touch her hair. Both Arian and Leah seem very happy while playing with Ruby's silky hair. Isu joins the young girl and sees him stride closer. Both girls hide behind Ruby and Ivan also joins them in the chat. To Ruby's pleasing surprise, Isu offers his hand and pulls Ruby closer. Ruby escapes his grip and looks for the gift she brought for Isuk. She pulls out the handkerchief she sewed yesterday with a letter of gratitude for her husband. With a beautiful smile dawn on her face, Ruby hands over the gift, hoping that Isuk may like it. Ruby fears that if she referred to the paper as a letter, Isuk may instantly throw it, so she deemed it as a story of her love, and Isuk accepts the gifts. She recognizes his expressions all too well, and at that moment, his face wears a weary expression that is all too familiar to Ruby. It is a look of exhaustion, a weariness that seeps into every line on his face. Upon inquiring, Isuk reiterates that he liked the gift. The weather in the north is quite different from the south. The summer is quite short, and on top of that, it is hard to see the sun, till it is summer making the weather more cold than usual. And she sits in front of the person she almost forgot that he ever existed, Isuk and Alenia's father, Duke Omerta. Ruby asserts aside from the eyes, there is no resemblance between Ellen and her father, Duke Omerta asserts that his son is a little old-fashioned and might not have been able to express himself, while Ruby thinks him more of a kind young noble. The Duke inquires about Ruby's visit to the temple. Though this question is not being asked for political reasons, it's a custom for northern nobles to hold a Choi night as a sign of becoming a couple to visit the temple and make a promise. In other words, the Duke is asking about her night out, although it's an odd question for her. In the novel, Rebecca spent the night with Isuk, although no one ever forced them to do anything. Ellen bursts out that Isu did not even show up on that day, clenching his fists in anger. The Duke bursts at Ruby in anger. How can it be possible to get married and not meet your obligations? His eyes turn red in mixed emotions of anger and fear. Duke is fretted that the Holy Father will never slander the North. The Duke's reaction is understandable for many reasons, considering her colorful past. Ruby also understands that they can't be called a couple if they don't have a physical connection at all. In addition, the Duke has actively promoted their marriage and also entailed the purpose of fixing his son's asceticism. After having the worst marriage in the past, it's a sign that marriage with a noble lady may take a little break in the future. Ruby clarifies that the ritual has been delayed due to her poor health. 
and with her improving health she is confident to visit the temple real soon. The explanation seemed to appeal to the relieved, Ruby smiles back at the Duke commending his kindness and consideration. It will be hard for them to call off the marriage after their first night, her past marriages too did not take place overnight. The annulment is a possibility but divorce is a hard path to follow. In Romagna, where the Pope rules divorce is not acceptable and the same goes for the countries bearing similar beliefs. This means that if Ruby chooses divorce, she will have to give up a lot. Duke is also aiming for something like this, but this will bring serious complications in the divorce, the process will be delayed and it will impact the poisoning timelines. But this way she will stay here in Krendel and most importantly she will not have to go back to the pathetic place she came from. But the problem is spending the night with a wooden stone like Isuk. The next day Rebecca visits the church where Endymion welcomes her inside and inquires if she is here for Isuk. She extends a plate of fresh apples to Endymion, their sweet aroma enticing their senses. As they enjoy the crisp and juicy fruit, Endymion directs Ruby's attention toward Isuk's ongoing fight. With every swing of his sword, Isuk displays remarkable skill and finesse, captivating the audience with his prowess. Ruby and Endymion, caught up in the excitement, cheer and chant for Isuk from the balcony. Isuk momentarily turns towards them and proceeds with the fight. Unpleased with Endymion's remarks, Avon smacks him in the face. Ivan turns towards Ruby and probes her purpose of visit. Ruby approaches Isuk commends his cool fighting skill and confesses her love for him again. On the other hand, Ivan forcefully pulls Andy aside, his stern expression indicating his disapproval of Andy's flirtatious approach towards Ruby. Unlike the last time Isuka proved her offer of fresh fruit, she gets closer to Ivan trying to wipe off the sweat plundering from his body, but Isuk stops her from taking a step toward him. Ruby thought the hesitation between them will ease down gradually, but it appears that her assumption was not the reflection of reality. They are still far from being a couple, Ruby tells him about the arrival of Duke Omerta at Isuk in response to show no real sincerity to the news. She tells him how angry the Duke was, she is scared of his anger. Isuk asserts that Ruby is acting more weird than usual, there is nothing much to be worried about. The reason for his anger is their first night, Isuk is not pleased to hear this directly from Ruby, but he tells her not to be worried about his father, he does not care much about his father either. Duke is his father, it's normal if he says something like this, but Ruby, she is caught in a battle of life and death. Isuk does not care if she wants something like a physical connection, he does not care about her or Duke's desires. Ruby insists that the night is purely a marriage ritual, nothing more for her. Moreover, she does not want to go back to Romagna, staying around Isuk is all she wants. But if Isuk wants to marry anyone else, she will have no choice but to move. Isuk probes if the only reason for her insistence is her desire not to go back. If they work on this ritual, no one will then interfere in this marriage. Isuk agrees to the ritual, the fretted Ruby acts very excited in front of him and asks if she prepare the bedroom. Caesar had assured Ruby that Isuk will not touch her, and it was the sole reason for the marriage. But tonight, after the night falls, there will be no turning back, her color turns pale in fear of what is heading towards her. She wonders what will happen if Isuk does not come and alters his mind at the last moment. Suddenly, the flashback of her night in the jungle crosses her mind and Ruby wishes to meet Popo someday. She prays before the god that tonight must go away and her husband may act less vulgar. She suddenly looks up and finds Izuk standing next to her in his nightshirt. Izuk takes a jab at Ruby, commenting that her appearance doesn't resemble that of a bride eagerly awaiting her husband. Meanwhile, Ruby glances at Izuk's well-built physique in disbelief. Izuk reminds her that once they perform the ritual, there is no going back. In a world where the protagonist can do anything they desire, she is a supporting actor whose entire goal is survival. Isuk takes off his clothes, he inquires if his wife is fretted upon seeing him, he slowly closes in on Ruby and pulls off her night, moving his hand over her face. Isuk asks her to stop biting her lips and relax. And that wraps up another thrilling recap, but the adventure doesn't end here. Prepare to be shocked by our second recap's unexpected plot twists and witness the evolution of your favorite characters. Subscribe to our channel if you want more twists, turns, and heart-pounding stories. Stay tuned for our next recap.